what's up Facebook supporters, you guys get to see this first. If you're watching this on the replay, it's because you're not cool like our Facebook supporters who subscribe four ninety nine dollars a month and get access to live stuff just for a tribe of people that cares deeply about building health 3.0. Now, the rest of the world will get it eventually, maybe if you're good. But in general, what I found with the supporter tribe is that it is a safe place to talk about healthcare transformation where people are actually nice to each other. Heaven forbid, that is not the internets I knew, but it is the internets I signed up for. So anyways, today guys, and thank you, by the way, it's still Nurses Week, so we wanna give a shout out. If you guys are watching some of the replay, you missed Nurses Week, and if you didn't thank a nurse, you suck. Today, I have a guest that is gonna be crazy fun. She is the author of this here book, That Good Night. It is Dr. Sunita Puri, who is the medical director of the Palliative Medicine Service at USC, the University of Spoiled Children. I mean, University of Southern California. And she and I share a lot in terms of our training, in terms of our South Asian ancestry, and in terms of our love for hip hop. But the reason I really wanted her on the show is this book is like, must reading for anyone who cares about having conversations about end of life, about what palliative care actually does, about how to live well and die well. So Dr. Puri, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad you could come. I'm sure the parents are so happy to see you. They're watching right now. They're very happy. It's too good. (laughs) Both, you know, I read the book and I was like, at first, you know, so a lot of doctors send me books. And let me tell you, doctors are generally the worst authors. You know, it's like all this footnotes, Ibid, all this. Ibid. Ibid. I'm like, Ibid has no place in a book. Ibid, I don't even really know what Ibid means. I don't either. I I feel like a bad writer for not knowing that. it's, 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 it's It's a mystery still. And so you sent me the book and I'm like, I couldn't get it to work. And then finally I got a PDF of it. And I was like, okay, all right, let me, let me try to read this. I read a few paragraphs. I'm like, okay, you know, typical Indian chick writing a book about her experience. (laughs) What haven't I seen? And then I start getting into it and I'm like, oh my God, I was along for a ride with you through medical school and internship and residency and fellowship and you know my same similar path UCSF Mm -hmm. Stanford and what struck me about it is you told your story through personal stories and through patient stories that did not end happily all the time they ended as they end in real life yep I found myself going I've had that happen I've had that happen getting emotional going Mm -hmm. yeah I remember that I thought it was just me and you come out feeling like you've done a palliative medicine fellowship Mm. the important parts about having conversations about connecting with other humans and about the why that it matters I mean how the hell where does it all start for you why did you even do this how I don't even know where to begin I'm a fan Well, I'm a fan of yours, which makes it extra special to be here talking to you about it. And I'm so glad you liked the book. And really, thank you for having me on today. I, you know, I was always a writer before I went into medicine. I grew up, you know, we have so much in common, especially in terms of our background. And I grew up with a Punjabi father who would read me stories. I'm so sorry. It's so hard. <laughs> Telling you, Parsi father, same thing. Well, he loves the whiskey. Oh, God, my he dad loves, loves the, the Johnny Walker black whiskey. That's, that's what all the uncles slash drunkles, as I call them. Drunkles. The drunkles. Amazing. Oh, my God. There's, I knew a lot of drunkles in my day. Yes, me too. And the great thing about drunkles and my father is that they have these incredible stories. And my father has this command of language in English, in Punjabi, and in Hindi. So I really grew up immersed in a love of language and in trying to figure out how to tell stories in my way. And my father really wanted me to be good at English. Mm. So every day when I was a kid, he would have me write a page. And it could be about anything. I mean, I wrote about parakeets who wanted new names. I know. Wow. I wrote about cats who became friends with owls. Oh, that old story. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I just found myself turning to writing and to the page and to the characters I would make up in my mind as kind of friends. And it was this whole other world that was just mine. Mm. And I think if I had had any guts, I would have just been a writer. But I came into medicine because my mother is a physician. And I wanted to be just like her. You know, I'm going to interrupt you for a second yes. because you said a couple things. If I had any guts, 
I would have just been a writer. Yeah. Man, I am so with you. If I had any guts, I would have gone into music and entertainment yeah. and those things. But the truth is, I don't regret a minute of it. I agree with you. Right, because we went yes. that fast. Now, you, you had a line in your book that I remember that I highlighted. And you know, I haven't highlighted shit since I was a friggin' medical student. And then it was just <laughs> to show that I was doing something, even though I didn't really read it. Uh, you said you went into medicine because that's where your mother was. Yep. I Expl followed my that. mother into medicine because that's where she was. That's the quote. And I still remember the moment that that line came to me. I had just come home from fellowship and I was writing and I was sitting in my mother's bedroom on the couch there and my one of her cats was sitting next to me and I was just kind of, sometimes when I write it's almost like word vomit on the page, you don't censor yourself, but that line was the probably the only line I kept from that whole page of word vomit that day. And, you know, I grew up loving and hating medicine. I loved it because my mom loved it so much. And I could see that in her work in anesthesia. That was really where she was meant to be. But I hated it because she was always on call and she was always away from me. And when I was born, I mean, talk about lack of work-life balance back in that day, my mother worked up until the moment she went into labor as an anesthesia resident. And she got two weeks off after I was born. So I actually was raised by my Naniji, my maternal grandmother, in Mumbai for months after I was born because my mom couldn't juggle being a resident and being a new mother. You know, and for the world that thinks this is an anomaly, I have the exact same experience. Yeah. So mother gave birth to me, worked right up to the day of my birth as a pathology resident. Oh, she wow. ultimately rematched in psychiatry because she's like, pathology is gross. She hated it, <laughs> hated everything about it. And, and I was raised for the first six months of my life by my paternal grandmother mm -hmm. in Pune, just south of yes. Mumbai. Wow. And same thing. And when I was reading your book, you were talking about being fed you know, bottles of warm milk and her rocking you on the plane. Same exact. I started getting emotional because that was the same experience. And then you know, later in the book, when you talk about her passing and that yeah. experience, it was the same thing for me and and being distant and and the diaspora yep. of it but but the the idea that we went into medicine because you know that's we followed our parents into medicine because that's where they were yes and for me it was both parents and so i felt the same thing it's almost like you, you were desperate for their attention when yep. you were younger yeah and i think that word desperate was really applicable mm. like i I remember just coming into my mom's room when I would come home from school and she was post-call and I would just jump on the bed because I just wanted her to wake up and love me. Mm. And I was, my brother and I were both, as she describes us, very sensitive children, which actually meant clingy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it was very hard for us to be apart from our mother. Mm. And now, I remember somewhere in the book I wrote about when I was a resident, and I thought my life was so hard, right? Internship in San Francisco, and oh my God, I'm on the liver transplant service. It's all so overwhelming. And then I thought to myself, when my mother was the age I was at that point, she was already married, had left her home for a continent. She had not a single blood relative mm. and had already had two children mm. and was in Louisville, Kentucky. Every time, and I just went on a rant for supporters about how we really have to pay our dues before we can claim to have moral injury and burnout. Yeah. And now I'm seeing a lot of young uh, students coming out and they're already so pre-burnt out that yep. they're saying, I can't work more than a 12 hour shift and this is not a learning experience for me. It's like, well, you know, it's it's almost disrespectful to the ancestry that we come from, the lineage that we come from, that they paid yeah. so many dues so we could have it better. Yes. But that means that we have to put in our effort too. We ha This Completely is a calling. Completely agree. Right. Completely right. agree. We didn't sign up for this profession to have a cushy lifestyle. Right. And I think when it was modeled for us, that the sacrifices that have to be made to be a good doctor, I never really expected that I would have a sort of perfect work-life balance because I saw what it took to take good care of patients. Mm. And I would round in the PACU with my mom, actually. Wow. She, when I would go to the hospital with her and I was kind of sitting in the surgical lounge waiting for her to come out of the OR, when she did, she would take me with her through the PACU mm. to see her patients. And I saw what it took. And even though I, I have such mixed feelings about it because it kept her from me. 
I still wanted to be that sort of doctor. Yeah, I had the same experience. My dad would take me on rounds of the community hospital, mm-hmm. go through the ICU, you know, because it was all open in those days. Yep. You know, the one doc did everything. He was the primary care doc, and he ran in the hospital, and it's a small rural community. Everybody knows him, doctor. And what, what struck me is the kind of collegiality. Yes. So all mm-hmm. the nurses and he and his colleagues were all nice to each other. You know what's weird is then you run into your actual practice, and one of the yeah. biggest struggles is our colleagues. Yes. Interacting with our colleagues. It's so true. And I think in palliative care, it's, an, it's a special sort of struggle mm. because you're kind of misunderstood even in the name of your field. Mm, explain that, yeah. I think when people hear the term palliative care in medicine, a lot of times they think that's synonymous with giving up. Mm. It's synonymous with waving the white flag or more insidiously, Calling palliative care means I, as a physician, have failed. Mm. And so I think it really strikes to the core of some of our biggest insecurities as physicians in wanting to cure it all, wanting to save our patients, thinking that the extension of life is our primary duty, when in fact our primary duty is to cure sometimes, but to care always. Mm. And so I have to find myself explaining and re-explaining my role. Whether it's I treat cancer pain, I don't just put people on hospice, or hospice and palliative care are distinct things. Mm. I think of hospice as a type of palliative care in the last six months of life. But our intention is to work with the primary team and not to kind of have an either or situation where a patient can either get cancer therapy or they can have palliative care. Mm. The beauty is that you can do both. And to walk alongside a patient and a family as they're going through that sort of journey and to get to know them from day one, I think that's one of the most profound parts of a journey to walk with a patient and family and with your colleagues. Because some of the most meaningful moments have been when I sit with my colleagues and I can acknowledge, I know this is hard for you because you've known this patient for years and I'm coming in at the 11th hour. So let me help you. It's okay that you're attached to them, but let me help you too. Yeah, and it's really hard for a lot of our colleagues. And, and so hard. That becomes so clear in the book. You know, I, what I loved about this book, and this is, I think, what distinguishes it from something like Being Mortal by Gawande, which was a great book I read it, totally different vibe. Now, that's, uh, it, it was, th- this is your experience and how you learn through these cases. And the great thing is they don't always turn out the way you'd like yes. them to. Because that's life. That's life. And when you know there was a there was a story <clears throat> at the end. For, first of all, some of the most beautiful stories were your home visits, yeah. where you're really doing palliative medicine. You, you know, you're forming these deep relationships. And the guy who went to his granddaughter's graduation and and just be, and you know, this is a guy who's got disseminated cancer and is in a lot of pain and wouldn't do uh, narcotics because he was afraid he was be too tired and he wouldn't be able to make it and and, yep. and also afraid that he was going to be robbed because yep. he lived in. It. I mean, the social determinants of health affect us not during only during life, but during how yeah. we're dying. Exactly. So it was a, it was a, it took me on this journey that reminded me too of my own training and the hardest conversations I've ever had. My favorite, and I got to say, I, I I hope I won't be giving too much away because people will read the book um, and get their own out of it. But at the very end, you had a conversation with Teresa and Ray, yes, which I imagine are nom de plumes because of Papa. <laughs> they and, are. You know, they have a, 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 a dad who's had a massive stroke after yeah. diabetes, CHF, and all that. And every ounce of them is screaming personality disorder. Yep. Every ounce of them is screaming, how am I ever going to get through to these people? Yeah. They're belligerent. They're questioning everyone's competence. They're threatening to sue. They want, quote, everything done. Yes. And I'm like, how many times? Yeah. And in the thing, what's beautiful is you describe your path, like, and then I felt this and I put it in check. And then I felt this and I put it in check. And I said this, then I felt this. Then I was like, hell no. Yeah. I'm just going to let it go now. This is what I said. And even you letting it go was pretty professional. So that takes practice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I try to abide by that famous line, check yourself before before you you wreck wreck yourself. yourself. You know why? Because Oxycontin in your life is bad for your health. See, that's, a, that's what separates Z-Dog Industries from uh, some other so-called interview circuits. Well, exactly. You know, I mean, when it gets too is... deep, we take it deeper. We take it deeper. Into the game. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But sometimes you have to wreck yourself. That's right. Because you're only human. Heaven forbid. Heaven forbid. I know. 
I I got that out of your book. Like, holy shit. She's letting the world into this very deep secret that we're human beings yes. who have internal conflicts and struggle. Yep. Not just the palliative side, but the colleagues we're working with. Exactly. And what your training was like and how, you know, you know, your ICU rotation at UCSF, I yep. was having PTSD, man. <laughs> that was it. It's like lines and tubes you know, and nine lines. Nine and 14 Moffat. Oh, 14 Moffat, the Death Star, we used to call it. <laughs> You know, and I just kept thinking, you know, power and the glory, yep. money and the power, yeah. minute after minute, <laughs> hour, hour after, after hour. hour. Yeah, we're hip hop <laughs> fans, if you can't tell. So, so you know, wh why did you write this book? So that's a great question, and it's one I get a lot. And my dad also asks me this because <laughs> Beta, I, why? Why did you write? <laughs> so much opportunity cost. Know, exactly, you could be churning the consult. You can <laughs> <laughs> and he also, when I gave it to him, he was like, "It's this long." <laughs> So, and I have to tell you actually later about what my dad said when he saw my review in The Atlantic for the oh, book. Wow. But to go back to why I wrote it, I think when you're a writer, I have I always felt like that had chosen me. Mm. And that sounds really pretentious, but let me explain. It was almost harder not to write the book than it was to write the book. Because all of these stories, the best way I can describe it is they were kind of pushing against my bones. Mm. They wanted to be let out. And I wanted to write a book that really helped me to understand my own path, but in a way that would be helpful to others. Mm. Sometimes I think I wrote the book because I wanted a book like this when I was in my training. One that showed me exactly what it meant to take care of patients whose treatment paths were not clear and they weren't textbook treatment paths, mm. but also one that showed me it's okay to be human and fallible mm. as a doctor, because we're not really allowed to be that. And I and I wrote it to honor my parents and their journeys, because so they are two major characters in the book. Yes. And I also wrote it to honor my patients and their families and my colleagues, even the ones that pissed me off and broke my heart and made me cry and made me feel incompetent. Mm. Because I think that's all part of this great tapestry of living in medicine, right? Mm. That it isn't perfect, it is messy, it is complicated. And yet it is still such a profound profession to be a part of, even when there were times where I was like, screw it, I'm just gonna leave and be a real writer. And I almost left mm -hmm. at the end of medical school. And it was when I did my palliative care rotation that I found this is a home for my medicine and it's also a home for my love of language. And so really this book is also a love letter to the power of language in medicine. Yeah. I think you pretty much effectively described the vibe that I got when I read it, which is this is her therapy, but it's also a gift to others, and it's a gift to the legacy of her patients and a gift to the legacy of your parents. It infuses the book, yeah. this idea that we're simultaneously respecting our parents, we're simultaneously rebelling against our parents, and we're simultaneously wanting to be like our parents yes. and please them. Mm -hmm. And this is, I don't think it's just an immigrant thing. I think this is a human thing. I agree. And what was beautiful is the way that you treat language in the book as a surgeon treats a scalpel, which is you can do great good and great harm yes. with the wrong words. Now on this show, it's interesting because we are the proponents of let's be as unpolitically correct as effing possible and let's use language um, as a flourish and as an art, but uh, understand that we're not gonna censor ourselves. When you're sitting in a, in a conversation with a patient yeah. about end of life, with a family meeting there and your colleagues there, this is a surgical procedure. Yes. Everything, and it's funny because you were talking about how you prepped for it, and you, and, I, and it's the way a surgeon might mentally go through and go through Cunningham's and go through the whole thing. And I thought that was beautiful because it, it elevates also the practice of palliative care and hospice and what you do to the art that it is yes. and the science that it is. Exactly. And I think, you know, I read in, I think it was a piece by Gawande, a palliative care doctor had described communication as a procedure. Mm. And I remember when I read that, the wheels completely turned in my head because I think when I was going through medical school, I never really got any great training in how to talk to patients, how to break bad news, right. how to kind of sit with someone after you've told them something really difficult, how to lead a family meeting. We, I think the implicit message was those are soft skills yeah. that you just kind of know. And if you don't know them, you'll figure it out. It's okay. But 
and I think I wrote about this a bit in the book, that when I was learning to do paracentesis and thoracentesis and central lines in my residency, I was supervised by a senior. And sometimes the senior was supervised by someone supervising me. Right. And that, if we had that sort of intense, dedicated sort of teaching and supervision in learning how to do a family meeting, how much better would our healthcare system possibly be? Oh, you know? I, I, see, I'm, I, maybe that's the real reason I loved this book and didn't just like it, was that it elevates relational therapy, mm-hmm. you know, in a non-psychiatric setting, yeah. <laughs> right? To a, a procedural art, like yeah. like you said, you, you should be supervised. This yep. should be taught. Mm-hmm. You know, you were talking about extubation. Yes. So, we're taught to intubate. People will supervise. Are we in the esophagus? Let's make sure we didn't do that. Uh, are, how far have we gone in? Did we, we don't want to ru- you know, rupture the trachea. We don't want to do anything else. Make sure the vent setting's are right. We're over-supervised on that. Oh, it's time, you know, yeah. mom does not want to be on this tube. We want to you know, pull it back and make her comfortable. Who teaches you that? And you know what, honestly, yeah. who taught me that in uh, residency was respiratory therapy. I was just going to say, yeah. RT, yeah. RT will teach you, and they will hold your hand and yep. stand by you. And I've been in the room when, you know, in the ICUs, when there's anesthesia residents who are extubating and don't know how to titrate an opiate mm. to keep the patient comfortable. Like, I'll be in there with them. Mm. And I can see, if, especially if it's their first or second time, how difficult that is. Yeah. And just that learn on not knowing how to undo what we've done. Is, it, is you, you said that. You're like, we're really good at doing these things. And then, you know, how do we? So Elizabeth e. Peters, let's take a few comments. Love this. Thank you. Feeling not so alone in end-of-life care. I've been doing mm. it for the last 26 years, trying to help people understand it means not giving up. Yep. You, you, you did a great job at the end of the book, especially where you said... This is what do everything means to various people. Yes. And it was a laundry list of shit. And I was like, <laughs> yep, I've seen that. Yep, yep, yep. It was really well done. Okay, listen, let, 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 me, let me just reiterate. Medical students, nurses, any student of healthcare, any practicing physician, anybody who's a healthcare professional should read at least part of this book to understand how we can better accomplish this. Because like you said, our whole system will improve. Yeah. Because we do it so badly. You, you know so why? Badly. See, this, is, this is my guess. And you probably know this because you went to, what, what, where'd you go to medical school again? Remind me. UCSF. You, oh, you were UC medical student too. Yes. So that was me, UCSF medical student. Then you stayed for residency. Yes, I did. I fled because the place was dark. <laughs> yes. I was like, I am out of here. I went to Stanford where it was cush. I did my residency there and still burned out. So I, when you had that space between medical school and residency where you're like, yeah. do I do this? Yep. I had that space after residency where I was like, wow. I'm gonna go work in tech for a year. Yep. Because I was in the Silicon valley and i was like i can't do this i was so decimated by my training by the human element of the training yes and how can i take all this on as myself and 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 still survive and um the 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 idea that what i ultimately realized was i was using empathy taking people's pain as my own yeah and not uh using compassion which Mm -hmm. is a detached love in the face of suffering, where you said it in the book, you said you hover just below, just above the depths. Yes, like the pelicans. Like the pelicans. They can pick out the little fish and there's a shark there. There's terrible stuff in the deeps. And if you go swimming every day, you're gonna get sucked down. You're gonna find it, yep. So how do you find that balance? In the book, there were great examples where you failed and great examples where you succeeded. What's your tip for people? That is such an important question. And I think for me, my strategy is around maintaining compassion but not having compassion fatigue. Mm. They kind of change and fluctuate depending also on what's going on on in the outside world in my life, not just in the hospital. But what I tell the medical students is I now do this exercise. Before I go in a patient room, I take a deep breath and I ask God to help me. And I ask him to help me to see their suffering, but not be enveloped by it. Hmm. And then when I'm sitting with a family, even if they're a bunch of Teresa and Ray's, right? I visualize like a clear plastic or glass between us so that I can fully see them and hear them and be present with them. But whatever emotions they may be throwing at me, don't come at me. 
And I need to practice that kind of visualization to go and be fully present with a family or my colleagues, almost in a meditative kind of way. Because when I'm really talking to someone like we're talking now, I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm fully focused on the words. But I think in order to maintain that intense concentration and hold people in compassion, I also need to be able to keep the emotions away from me so that I can walk into the next room and do the same thing again. That's a beautiful description of, and it's interesting because you're a very spiritual person. It infuses the book. I discovered spirituality late in life Mm -hmm. in the sense of meditation and an almost Buddhist kind of thought. And it's a, it is an equanimity Yep. in the face of overwhelming yeah. emotion. And that doesn't mean you don't feel emotion, it doesn't mean you don't get lost in the sauce from time to time. Exactly. But the, but the example that you gave of Ray and Teresa was a great one because I was there listening, I was reading the thing and I was there in the room. Yep. And I could feel that transference yeah. where Teresa is attacking you. Wait a minute, how much did you study yep. that you're still asking me what do everything means? It yep. means do everything. Yep. Are you stupid? Yep. What's wrong with you? Exactly. And you can feel, even now my blood pressure starts to rise, right? Because I've been in those rooms. Do you need some amlodipine? I might need more than that. <laughs> I might. The only thing that helps me starts with a D, woman. And oh you got it. God. You got it. The D ain't for di- free. It's, di- <laughs> it's diclofenac, son. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> and, and you know, it's interesting because the minute I met you too, so people might get the sense now because we're having this intense discussion. Yes. Well, these are two intense, uptight people. Exactly. Yeah, very long. type A. The minute, the minute you and I met for the first time in the lobby, we're like, "Bitch, what's up? What's <laughs> up? Yo, do you? Yo, what's up with Waka Flocka, man? Waka Flocka, Waka Flocka is a genius. He's a genius. I mean, that line, girl, you, your booty got me lost like Nemo. Your booty got me lost like Nemo. If language is a scalpel, <laughs> that shit is a samurai sword right there. <laughs> I mean, that could be my next professional stop you know what writing lyrics like i've that. needed a fly girl hey and i had logan mm-hmm. but he's not fly enough he's not no That's compared right. to me come on plus how demeaning is that well you can be my fly girl because you're a woman it's like how about you be the main rapper and i'll be your fly girl that would be amazing i think it'd be dope let me be your cardi p <laughs> <laughs> cardi p <laughs> I like it like that i do like you, it do you like want to do, do you want to do a like a, a hospice palliative care like rap yes absolutely that would be dope it could with be Cardi like a b. psa totally totally that like uh, i like it like that and then i can just come out and fake spanish or punjabi yes <laughs> and, and, and we'll just put some fake <laughs> translation that's awesome just have my dad walking around oh, in the background awesome. Dude, and my dad walking just around all of the south asian dads everyone walk everyone, everyone. I want to get back to the spirituality piece, but yes. first let's read some comments. Sorry, I, I, I always have to take my ADD back <laughs> on point. So John Arnold Jr. says, ER doc for 15 years, this convo is reaching me personally and professionally. Mm. You know what? That's a beautiful comment. Because yeah. in your book, you talk about some of the hardest things are yeah. working with colleagues. Yeah. Well, it's explain so Explain a little bit. Yeah. I think because, you know, many of my colleagues were not, exposed to palliative care in Mm. their training. And if you even look at the culture of medicine and how we're socialized, it's really to keep people alive, to extend survival benefits, right? It's even coded into the language of how we study interventions. Mm. And so to take a step back and say, maybe our role is more than just keeping people alive. Maybe we need to think more critically about the gap between what we can do for patients and what we should do for patients, especially when they're living with incurable chronic illnesses or a final blow that we cannot reverse. And so I think when you're not socialized to think about medicine in that way, it can be, it's almost like you're speaking different languages to colleagues. Mm. And that's where, you know, when some, when a colleague might consult me and say, you know, I don't really know if we need you, but my resident is really pushing for it. So what do you think? And one of the most interesting questions I, I love to ask this question is, well, tell me what you're hoping that I can help you with. Tell me what you think your resident was thinking. And then you get people to all explain to you the details of the case and to get them to say out loud, but I think I can fix this. Mm. And then I get to ask them, tell me what fixing this looks like. What are we fixing them to? What would this patient's life look like 
if he leaves the hospital? What will it look like when he's still here in the hospital? Mm. And I think that's when you kind of have to almost do a palliative care consult on your colleagues to get them to look at their hopes and the reality of a situation and try to meet in the middle somewhere. Mm. So I think the challenge with colleagues is we're just so, we just want to fix things. Yeah. We're such fixers as physicians. And I am guilty of it too, even in palliative care. If I may say, sometimes I have felt like if I can't get a patient to agree to be DNR when it's so obvious that they should be, I feel like I haven't oh, fixed yeah. the situation. Mm -hmm. So I am no less prone to this than my other colleagues are. I mean, it, in the book, you know, there's this conversation you're having with a nephrologist in your car mm -hmm. and this patient that you're taking care of at home, you're seeing this patient at home. Yep. They're skipping dialysis, they're missing dialysis, they, they are dying. Yeah. And they don't need to be on dialysis, they need to be with family and, and doing all the work that happens at end of life, in your mind. Yeah. And you call the nephrologist and he goes, well, listen, man, I, she needs to tell me she doesn't want dialysis because I'm gonna keep giving her dialysis. I'm not the one to make that decision. Yeah. You know, I'm mean, basically saying I'm not playing God. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, uh, but you know, and, and you have the conversation when you get off the phone, you're like, okay, that you, that's great. Okay, I'll go ahead and I'll keep having the conversation with her. And you hang up and you start banging on the horn and saying, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, man, I've been there. Yeah, I'm sure. And you I've have. been the I've been the recipient of the fuck you. Oh, because I yeah. have been the you know guy who wants everything done at times, yeah. right? When I feel like I'm attached, yes. or something's happened, or there's transference where yep. it's like you know you talk about your, the auntie in the yep. ICU. And it's like every Indian you know yeah. auntie, and you, you you feel the transference, and and that's why I think it's another. This is one of my soapboxes. It's like empathy. Yeah, feeling others' pain is a spotlight. Yes. You take the pain, I'm talking about emotional empathy, mm -hmm. affective empathy. So in other words, I see someone who looks like my mother or who looks like my daughter or who looks like me racially or socioeconomically, yep. and I'm able to feel their discomfort more acutely as my own and act from it yes. in a way that may not be a higher compassion. Totally. And, and so empathy in itself is a spotlight. It tends to favor your own kind, yep. nationality, tribe, whatever. And we need to try to start to disentangle that from what you describe, which is walking in and there's a, a thin but but transparent membrane yep. where you can understand all the suffering, but yeah. it doesn't it doesn't reach out and consume you yes. and affect your decisions. Exactly. Right. And I think that is such an astute point because I have definitely taken care of people, some of whom have been fellow physicians, and my judgment has been clouded. Mm. Because to see one of your own who's very sick oh, in yeah. whatever one of your own might mean, whether it is ethnicity or profession or something, your, my judgment was completely clouded. And that's when I think having the self-awareness and the insight to say, if this was the patient in bed eight, I would not be saying this. So why am I doing this yeah. to the patient in bed three? Yeah. And to be brave enough to confront yourself about your own biases and your attachments, especially when those get in the way of the right things being done for patients. It's the hardest thing in the world, physician, know thyself. Exactly. It's the hardest thing yes. in the world. Because those biases and transferences and stuff are so, they can be so damaging to doing the right thing. Yeah. And But we'll convince ourselves that we're doing the right thing totally. because of the transference. By the way, Suzanne Anderson says something that I've heard very often. Why do they put nails in coffins? to keep the oncologists out. <laughs> so what is your experience? You talk a little bit about oncology in yeah. the book. This is hard because I have a lot of love and compassion for my oncology colleagues. Yep. They trained to save lives by treating cancer. Yep. And when they f are unable to do that, they become attached to their patients. Yeah. It's very hard for them to let go because yeah. they're a hammer and maybe that patient is a nail. Yep. But also they care, they really do care about their patients. And we had uh, Gail, Rem uh, sorry, uh, Lois uh, Ramondetta on the show. She's a MD Anderson cancer, guy and cancer doc. Mm -hmm. And her thing is mixing palliative with oncology. Yeah. So she's much better about integrating. But what's your experience with oncology? How do you handle those sort of situations? Oncology is interesting because, you know, I, I've known a number of oncologists who um, who say, in theory, that they appreciate and support palliative care. Mm. But many of them may also think that chemotherapy is palliative care. Mm. And so, and sometimes I can't really disagree with them. If someone has a big tumor burden and it's very chemo responsive, the best treatment for the symptoms could be chemo. Right. But I think where 
things become difficult is that there's a number of them who might think that they know how to have these discussions and think that they are having these discussions. And when I see the patients, that's not the case. Mm. Or something is being lost in translation. Mm. The oncologist may think they're saying, this is an incurable tumor, but what the patient is telling me they understand is that it is still curable. Yes. And actually something I've long wanted to do is act just shadow in the oncology clinic and observe those conversations. Not to be critical, but just to understand, right? Because I think I can help them the most if I approach with a, from a place of understanding. You, you nailed it. You know, if we walk in each other's shoes. Yes. You know, if I, if I was a nurse for a week, could you imagine the empathy or the compassion I would oh, have yeah. for that job? And it's Nurses Week. And, 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 and a, 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 a couple of things relating to that. How you approach colleagues is crucial. It's a kind of surgery. If yes. you come off as condescending or holier than thou, or you're trying to pull the plug on all their patients, yep. they are going to immediately entrench because we are defensive by nature in medicine yep. because we're attacked all the time. Yes, and so it's we're so true. We've gotten good at it, right? How about in residency? You got to be a wall. You got to block this admission. You yep. got to argue. That was a UC and a Stanford thing. It oh, was yes. You're a, he's a sieve. That's it, the deepest <laughs> insult, right? Like he's just letting everything through. What kind of punk ass bitch is that? <laughs> like you need to be a wall. Yes. And here's Polly uh, Barker Walker says, I'm a stage four breast cancer patient. Mm. I've had the same oncologist for 15 years. Oh, we have wow. a great professional relationship and he does well with my palliative care, but I know many who are not yeah. as great. And I think, you know, it's some... Something that I am hoping to do is to push for more palliative care training in their fellowship. Mm. And at USC, the oncology fellows have an incredibly busy, crazy schedule, and so there's not as much time as I wish there was for mm. them to rotate with us. But we work with them a lot at the Norris Cancer Center. So just seeing them on the wards, having them call consults, helping them to understand even basic things like when to start a long-acting pain medicine. Mm. Which, How do you choose a long-acting pain medicine? And when do you call for help? Yeah. Because if I were to meet the palliative needs of every oncology patient, I would never leave the hospital. And so part of the trick is teaching them what is the primary palliative care skill set that they can do themselves. And then when do you call for help? Because if even as internists, if we had no basic understanding of how to treat AFib and we called cardiology for everything they would hate us even more than they already do. Exactly, and, and they do hate us. And yeah. they hate us, yes. Yeah. And so um, it would be, that's kind of the analogy I would draw, that all of the oncologists need to have that basic competency. And the more we can get programs to really adhere to the ACGME requirements around that, I think the better off all patients in the future are gonna be. Uh, I'm with you a thousand percent. The other thing we need to fix is reimbursements for palliative care. Oh yes. Right, because y'all are broke. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm sure your parents are like, Beta, why? You could have been a cardiologist, dude. What are you doing? Dude, my dad, I think to this day, still secretly hopes yeah. that I will go back and see the light and become a cardiologist. Can, 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 can I tell you what my yes. dad still tells me? So he's like, so you're moving back to the Bay area. Uh, is that because you failed again? Oh, like, uh, no. no, no, we're actually growing and we think we can do better there and I want to be next to the social networks that I built yeah. there over the years and the three universities that are in spending distance and all the guests so it's not too late to do a GI fellowship is oh. what you're telling me <laughs> I'm 46 dad I love what I do I found my calling it's never too late it's never too, <laughs> it's never late. too late you know well has he met your med emoji Dr. Krapin Krapindra? Oh, Krapindra Pumoji? <laughs> yeah. It, I think he has because he's on my email list. Oh Although he, he got expunged because uh, for some reason he has an AOL email. And I think MailChimp oh, thought AOL was a scam Chimp. because anyone who still has an AOL is like 100 years old. Oh. And so my dad the other day, he's like, I haven't seen any of your videos for a month. And I'm like, really? We have some good ones. You're, not, you're on my list. He better I, watch this one. I, I, he better watch this one. Hi, exactly. uncle. <laughs> Oh, you know what though? So here's the thing, my parents are not supporters of the show. In other words, they really? don't they're not subscribers. And this is why my dad asked me, he's like, "So am I supposed to pay 4.99 to see my own son do the <laughs> nonsense?" <laughs> And I said, no, dad, I'll figure out a way with Facebook how to get you a free subscription. There is no such way exists. So this is my safe space oh. where I know, now this is gonna go public and he probably won't watch it because he's like, an hour, who wants to listen to two <laughs> Indians talking for an hour? I could go to any function and hear them yapping away, <laughs> right? They go to the function. 
none of the kids are going to eat the spicy food. I'll have my Johnny Walker. <laughs> that's right. Not red because that's cheap. That's black. Black. But don't do gold. Why waste the money? <laughs> Blue. Who spends that kind of money? Blue. blue. I didn't know there was a blue. There's a blue. Oh my god. But my dad would say money doesn't grow on wines. Wine. It grows on work of the back. The sweat of the of the anus. <laughs> Why it's anus. Um let's read some comments. <laughs> <laughs> British palliative care doctor Catherine Mannix has a video circulating on her BBC about her book. She's uh, amazing regarding the power of taking control in a dignified de- death. She's done talks to uh, all around the world. Palliative care doctor, 30 years, for some 30 years. Look her up as well, Carrie Hinchliffe. So Carrie's a UK uh, mm-hmm. nurse, medically retired. Um, let's see, I would pay to listen to Z Dad for an hour, Elizabeth uh, Sirigar. <laughs> my dad is my dad is Facebook famous, and Risa Dubois says defensiveness equals self preservation. Yeah, it is. I think that's very true, mm-hmm. very true, mm-hmm. and it's about trying to see what does the defensiveness serve. Does it serve you? Does it serve your patient? Oh, it. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah, there are times when we convince ourselves where we're fighting for our patients. Yep. Yeah. But really. We're defending some ego structure that says, I'm right and you're not. Totally. This is what my psychiatrist brother and I talk about all the time. Oh, your brother's a psychiatrist? My brother's a psychiatrist. Sid. Sid. That's right. I read the book. Yes, you did. I feel like I know your whole family. Like I could just show up, auntie, please let me in. I heard you make a mean doll. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) She will make for you chicken tikka masala. Oh God, it's so good. It's so good. But you know, I'll tell you, your father, you told the story. I, I no, I won't break this. I won't. This is a piece of great wisdom in the book. I won't tell, but but is it a part of the book you want to read for us? Absolutely, I oh, would love yeah. to. Let's well, see. Do, it, do a reading. We haven't done a reading on this show. This will be a first, and I'll give you a beatbox if you like. Well, can someone just drop a beat in the background? These two? Yeah. Look how white Tom is. <laughs> Ex- except he's actually deeper in the hip hop game than Should I'll I ever be. Should I put on some Snoop Dogg? I mean, awesome. I was listening to nothing but a G thing. On the whole, on the whole flight up. That is the only thing you can listen to. Was it Southwest? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Southwest. You have to listen. You to have that. to block everything out and just listen to Snoop and Dre. Oh, I mean, gro- it almost sounded vaguely Indian. It does. When I was, I, I that song came out when I was in seventh grade. And you grew up in the '90s in LA. You have to be all about Snoop and Dre. Uh, yeah, I still and am. And Tupac. I mean, I still he's am. the best. Oh, I mean, come on, Pac. Pac. Mr. International, play yeah. with a passport. Exactly. And don't forget, one, two, three, and two, the foe. Snoop, Snoop Doggy, 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 Doggy and Dr. Dr. Dre is at the, the dough. dough. Ready to make an entrance, so back on up. Because you know we about to rip shit up. <laughs> now give me the microphone first so I can <laughs> bust like a bubble. <laughs> Come Coming along, Long Beach, Beach together. together. Yeah, you, you know, know we're in trouble. trouble. Ain't, Ain't nothing but a G thing, baby. To, uh, let's see, hospitalist and palliative, and we're crazy. <laughs> Z Dog LLC is the label that pays me. Unfadeable, so please don't try to fade me. <laughs> Dude, I love it. So, you were listening to a lot of hip hop when you wrote the book? I actually was, yeah, yeah. And I've never talked about the process of writing the book very about, much. So, I, to be honest, I don't know how I wrote this while working full time. I, for a while, I was the only palliative care doc covering two hospitals at USC, the Keck Hospital and the Norris Cancer Center. It was me and my amazing social worker, John Papas. Oh. I have to give a shout out to John Papas. Papas don't preach. <laughs> <laughs> Greek guy? I think half Greek and half Italian. Wow, that's yeah. a fiery mix. He's yeah. a fiery mix. Mm-hmm. He's an amazing, amazing social worker. He's mm-hmm. just got a heart of gold. And it was the two of us seeing like 700 consults a year how, how, for a while. And the interdisciplinary aspect of palliative is special. Like the social workers, the yep. nurses. Yeah. So important. I have a fantastic nurse practitioner, Flor Elorta. Ah. She is Filipina. I, oh, I nako. Yes. <laughs> I always talk to her about how much I love buko pandan. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. It's so good. The pancit. <laughs> it's so delicious. Um, but make sure to check the magnesium. Magnesium. Magnesium yes. and the calcium. And the calcium. And very good. Okay, yes. so, sorry. But the interdisciplinary nature yes. of palliative care, because one person with 
medical training, which is decidedly narrow, yeah. one person cannot possibly attend to all the domains of suffering yeah. that patients and families and colleagues are experiencing, the physical suffering, the emotional suffering, the spiritual suffering. And that's why you need a team. I might go see a patient and have a certain assessment, and then John might go see a patient and have a very different assessment. Mm. So it's so useful to have two lenses on the same situation. That's kind of how I think about it, is different lenses in this circular shape, huh. all kind of on the same situation. And we see very different things. It might be that a patient responds much better to my nurse practitioner than to me. It might be that I'm seeing a Punjabi family and you know, John can come with me and make sure that I don't have a whole lot of transference going on. So you need that team, that, that the team is everything in palliative care. You know, I did the keynote for the American Association of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. No, I wasn't there that year. Yeah, I'm because, so sad I missed it. Because you're a hater. <laughs> and haters need to back off, okay, number one. Number next, um, I, I remember being awed by the fact that the hospice and palliative care space has been health 3.0, yeah. collaborative, team-based, yep. holarchical instead of hierarchical. So in other words, everyone yeah. practices at the top of their training in a, in a team where you may be the best at this, someone else is the best at this, but no one is really dominating anyone else in, a, yep. in this kind of hierarchical way. And you guys have been doing that forever. Yep. And I was like, y'all are the enemies of suffering and you've been doing 3.0 forever. Like it's, I don't even have to give the talk, you already know this. Yep. You know, it was fantastic and it was in Chicago and they had that deep dish, though. Mm -hmm. oh Do you know I have never had Chicago deep dish pizza? Dude, you're missing out on one of the wonders of the world. I know. But you got to be careful because some of them are whack. You got to get the right one. The right. I'll have to. The next time I'm headed out there, which. The Z Pack will back you up. I, well, yeah. I'm They'll just going to hit you up. I'm going to text you and be exactly, like. Exactly, man. I'm going to Chicago. Gotta hit that Lou Malnati's. <laughs> uh, so let me do a reading before I yes, forget. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and I think what I am actually going to read is from the part of the book where I am doing home visits. Mm. Because that that is something I really miss doing. Because now I do only inpatient and I opened a clinic about a year and a few months ago. Oh. But I really miss, there's something about being in the home which is where hospice and then palliative care really began. Mm. And needing to look at the environment, really understanding what social world your patient inhabits, and trying to make the most of whatever forces have structured their lives at the end of their lives, knowing that you can't fix it all. So I'm going to read from the chapter called Drive. I park and walk along a sidewalk lined with broken concrete to my first patient's home. On my way, I pass a commercial building adorned with a painting of a young man with a double chin, small mustache, and short spiky hair. Below it, in black lettering, are the words, R.I.P., always in our hearts. I turn the corner and walk past another home with a cross made of fresh pink flowers nestled outside its security fence. A photograph of a young man rests against it. Loss lives everywhere here. I knock on the door of Sergio, a patient I have met twice before, once on a home visit two weeks earlier, and once in the hospital shortly after that. I wait on his narrow porch next to a Safeway grocery bag filled with used blue hospital gloves and empty hand sanitizer bottles. I can't see anything through the steel security screen that guards his door and most doors in this neighborhood. If I squint, I can just barely make out the shadow of an approaching figure. Sergio's wife, Maria, opens the door and hugs me hello. Sergio smiles weakly from his bed, five feet away from the front door. His smile is outgrowing his shrinking face. He cannot eat because stomach cancer has blocked off his bowels, triggering nausea and vomiting if he even takes a sip of water. At 45, Sergio isn't thinking about how to die a good death. He is still grappling with why death has come for him so soon. He tells me that he's feeling much better today than he did last week, 
The medications I'd prescribed took away his nausea and pain. Maria had taken him to a movie. He had the stamina to talk for nearly an hour on the phone with an aunt he hadn't seen in 20 years. He'd also been able to sleep through the night for the first time in a month. I can dream again, he tells me with a wide smile. I notice an open photograph album on his bed. I want to show you who I used to be, he says. I did not always look like this. I barely recognize the man in the photos he shows me. He was probably twice his current size, a round, joyful-looking man who lived in cotton t-shirts and a size two small jeans. His wife's arms wrapped tightly around his muffin top. <laughs> My friend took these, he says, as he shows me his wedding photographs. He and Maria married in the church they still attend. They don't have family in the United States. Each left Mexico 10 years earlier and happened to meet in dance class. We don't have much, he told me on our first visit, but we do have God. There is a rosary draped around the bottle of liquid morphine at his bedside. With the help of a neighbor, Maria tries her best to get him in and out of bed, bathe him, and recognize when to give him different medicines for pain or nausea. Her brow furrows, and there are deep lines between her eyebrows that Sergio tells me are new. I know that the hospice nurse has instructed her to give one medicine if he has pain and another if he's nauseated, but Maria is afraid, as so many caregivers are. Sometimes I don't understand what problems I should be looking for, she tells me, and I could never forgive myself if I miss something, if he suffered because I am not a nurse. Her worry keeps her awake at night, watching the rhythmic rise and fall of Sergio's chest, alert to changes in its tempo, fearful that she might be asleep if it suddenly halts. She tells me that she sleeps next to him as his caregiver. It's been a long time since she's felt like his wife. Mm. It helps her when I show her the various ways the body demonstrates distress. Does he ever breathe like this? I ask in Spanish, heaving my own chest rapidly and wearing a look of distress. She shakes her head. I act out other symptoms aside from the obvious grimacing in pain, the nausea that can accompany even the tiniest sip of water, the confusion and agitation that can characterize the final hours. I start to write down which medicine to give in each instance, but remember that Maria cannot read very well that she instead identifies medications by the color and size of each one. We instead discuss which medicines can be useful in each scenario, the liquid or the pill. But I know she will not remember it all. I cannot expect her to. Her own breathing becomes rapid and shallow every time we discuss these things. I feel a heaviness in my chest when she asks me why hospice cannot pay for caregivers. I wish I knew. I wish our system were different, I tell her, silently wondering, as I often do, why our healthcare system will pay for last-ditch effort chemotherapy for a dying patient, but not for one trained caregiver to help them remain comfortable at home. After I wrap up my visit, Maria walks me to my car. She is barely five feet tall, yet she is protective of me and walks me out every time I visit her arm around my waist. When we reach my car, she turns and asks me if I believe in God. I don't know why this happened to him. He's only 45 and he's done nothing wrong, nothing at all. Maybe if we beg God, maybe if you beg God, he won't need your medicines and I won't be alone. She barely finishes the last sentence, burying her face in her hands and weeping. Tom Heineber, I'm pouring some out for my previous career. I'm going into palliative medicine. <laughs> Seriously, that was a beautiful story. That pretty much, and I wet my foot with that pour out just now. <laughs> that was a beautiful story. And I remember reading it in the book and this idea that, uh, you know, here he, we spend so much money on end of life on stuff that doesn't matter. Yep. And what you just did there is a bigger intervention and having a caregiver is a bigger intervention than anything else yeah. we could do. And exactly. yet, here we are. What I was really pouring it out for was our healthcare system. 
Yeah. Because it's been dead for a long, a time, long time. And it's time we took about 360 joules. We need to <laughs> we need to get it off of life support, <laughs> resuscitate it and get it popping. Yep. Man, that that and that's an example of what I was talking about in that book. You're in this place with the patients and with you and you're in the headspace of the doctor and if you don't understand what palliative is after reading that book then it's not comprehensible for you <laughs> because you might be a psychopath then you have failed <laughs> and then you have failed and then you speaking of failure while you were doing that i was looking at comments and people uh-huh. are saying i'm literally welling up rachel mark antonio you are mm. a very special person i'd be a puddle with every single patient right taking that on mm. um who the hell is chopping onions here? Seth Narenberg. That's a dude right there, okay? <laughs> I hate sexism. Even a dude is crying. Uh, I really think if I read this book, I would be changing careers and entering end of life care, although I'm, I'd be keeping Kleenex tissues in, in business, Alexandra Powers. Aww. And then in the setting of all this, my dad texts me. No way. Of course he's not watching because he's not paying the four ninety nine because he's a cheap Indian dad. <laughs> and he says, referring to the nursing video that he just got the email for because I put him back on the list. Uh-huh. The always a nurse video that we put out. Yeah. What is the original title of the song and who did the singing? <laughs> so in other words, he doesn't believe that I sang the damn oh song. My God. I don't know whether Epic to be insulted. Epic fail, dad. Epic fail, dad. <laughs> Ruben. But I also love you, Uncle. That's right. Yeah, oh, thank I you. will come to the Central Valley and drink some Johnny Walker with oh, you. Oh, he would have. He has a bar in our old. I'm ha- sure he ranch does. Style house. I'm sure he does. Close California. I can envision it. There is a bottle of blue, and understand why the Johnny Walker blue is there. Yes, because my brother, mm-hmm. who is effectively like a every Persian businessman you meet in Southern <laughs> Cal, like in Orange County. He's that guy, right? And uh, you know, gold chain, cologne. Oh my God! I'm, I'm making he should this be up. in your videos. He should. He decides he's going to impress my dad by mm-hmm. buying a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue. Uh huh. Because he's like, well, if Dad likes black, this will be my way as a good son to impress him. Uh uh-huh. The blue. And in my mind, I know my dad better. I've been alive longer. <laughs> I'm like, Mm-mm. watch what happens. And this is what happens. Blue. He goes right on Google. Types with his chicken of finger. Of course he does. That's one hundred and fifty dollars a bottle. <laughs> Are you crazy? Why did I support you all those years so you can waste money on this? It tastes the same as blue. A black tastes better. <laughs> I love I, your I mean, dad I mean, so much. The one thing I do have to let him know right now is I'm more of a bubbles girl. Oh. So yeah. I will have a prosecco, and once I've had prosecco, no I that. can have some Johnny Walker. No shame in that. You know, because you're not supposed to. Yeah, exactly. That's that's correct. Yeah, that's culturally I think correct. It is. It's for me. I kind of, in order for me to deal with the taste of Johnny Walker, because mm. it is not my favorite. Sorry, Dad. Um, not your dad, my dad. Fart, fart. Oh, they're all the You're same. You're dead to us. <laughs> 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 my dad's like, don't be such a girl. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, Punjabi men. Yeah. We yeah. can talk about them. I mean, very deeply masculine. Yes. In so many ways. And I find it so fascinating to have grown up with a father who's very masculine, who kind of raised me as a boy because, and thank you so much for this, Dad, he told me when I was a kid, I think I was six or seven, I will not leave you dependent on anyone in this world. Oh, that's beautiful. You need to stand on your own two feet. Mm. Mm. So I will raise you like a boy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, that I feel like I know your parents reading the book, you know, I, and you know y- your mother in particular because yeah. she's such a central character in the book, and uh, that idea of just being with her in the in the hospital and yeah. calling, the, how the hospital operator knew your your name oh, as yes. a child. Yep, that was me, and the answering service and all that. Like they'd be like, "Oh, hey, Zubin, yeah, no, I think your dad's in, you know, is in a consult somewhere, but I'll let him know, you know." And that's, it says so much about how much a hospital was part of our world yeah. as children. It was oh. like a second home. And we were both in utero in the hospital, Yes, right? that's a great point. It's yes. really interesting because I think about that sometimes because I love and hate medicine like you. Like there's a, there's a yeah. thing, there's a tension, there's the humanity that's so often ignored, there's this idea that we do so much stuff that's wrong, yep. and yet, and yet, there's this 
fatal draw to it. Yes. That we can't quit. I can't quit you, medicine. <laughs> you completely. You couldn't me. hit it and quit it. <laughs> exactly. I couldn't hit it, quit it, lick it, and split it. So I, I had to. I, we had to go into it, and I think some of that is our in utero conditioning, and then yes. the fact that it is part of who we are. You know, karma is an interesting thing. Yes. And uh, I think it's really causes and conditions that are set up from birth and before birth, and in the sense that. One thing leads to another, leads to another. Yep. And when your parents are in medicine and you're conditioned, yep. you're gonna to start to get, and it is good because it led us down a path where we think we're actually doing some good in the world. Yes. And so what's your advice to medical students coming up in the game? You know <laughs> well, what I'm saying? You mentioned karma, so can I just make an allusion to a genius line? From a Little Wayne featuring Drake song. Uh, you don't, you know, the the idea of genius line and Little Wayne. That's just redundant. I mean, I, I mean, truly, it just goes. yes. Karma is a bitch, so just make sure that bitch is beautiful. Oh snap! Yep. Yo, Little Wayne just owned us, Tom <laughs> Heineber. <laughs> so that I, I will answer your question, but once you said karma, I have to say. I was very distracted for the that rest a, of you. And it's a good line. It, it's a great My line. My daughter asked me if karma was real. Mm -hmm. And I had to have this discussion because look, yeah. look, and this is an interesting discussion too, but, uh, and I forget what question I asked you before all this went off the rails. What was it? <laughs> what advice would I give med students? Right, so we'll end with that. Yeah. So, because we're coming up on an hour, uh, coming up oh, in the ready? game, can't trust nobody. <laughs> I know. Well, hey, thoughts on Cypress Hill? You know, you're going to hate me and all the viewers are going to hate me. I don't have particular thoughts on Cypress Hill. Mm -hmm. They don't move me one way or another. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they came up in the game, yes, 94, 93. They did. The nine trizet. I was just besotted with the Snoop. by Pac. By Pac, Snoop. yeah. I was just all about them. There was no more room in my heart for anyone else in the 90s. And that brings us back to Except karma. maybe Usher. Oh, Usher. Usher? Usher? Yes. yes. <laughs> Do you know we did I did a, love Usher. We did oh. a parody of Yeah. I know. Yeah. I've seen it. We watched it in our palliative care team room as we've watched all your videos on rounds. <laughs> it's genius. <laughs> Look out, mouth to mouse ridiculous. In the club when the mouse was siculous. And yo, your protocol's all out of date. Blowing air down his pipe is so 2008. So forget about that. I'm going to squeeze the chest. CPR hands only when your homie arrests. Uh, I got to say. I would say, make him DNR. I would totally Just. make him DNR. I'd be like, I'm not doing this hands only CPR. How about no CPR? How about, how about you could do it with no hands, as Waka Flocka says. That's exactly right. So back to karma, since it all all roads lead to that. So my daughter's like, you know, karma, and you know, she understands I'm I'm kind of an agnostic Buddhist, yes. more or less. So I believe in I'm a spiritual. I meditate. I believe in causing. I think we're all consciousness. That's what yes. I think. So I explained to her that karma is simply cause and effect that stretches back far into history before you were born. Yeah. And the, the stuff that was, it's nothing metaphysical. It's actually simple science. If yeah. consciousness is a thing, it's mm -hmm. unfolding. Yes. And what you say, what you think, what you do, how you affect others in this vast social network, it ripples out into your community and into the universe in ways that you can never predict, mm -hmm. but you can intend for yes. good or you can intend for ill. Yep. And that will come back in an effect in yep. some way. And she looked at me blankly like, bitch, just just forget it. Is it real or not? <laughs> yeah, is it real or not? Okay, because I feel like I've done some bad stuff and I don't want you know to get in trouble. But I think what you hit on there is intention. Mm. And that was something that someone said to me maybe about a year ago, that if you're doing something, you can't always, the outcome of what you do, you can't always control. You could say something to someone with the greatest and purest intention and they could take it the wrong way. Yes. But the only thing you can control is your intention. Yeah, that's right. And that was so empowering to hear because I have always been someone that's a people pleaser, that's wanted to protect people from bad feelings, so I'll take on the bad feelings for them. And that's very toxic. And I think as in medicine, this can get to my advice to med students, we're all people pleasers, right? We all want to get the A on the test. We all want to fix the patient's disease. That's what we want to do. I would say to med students coming up in the game, try to be compassionate with yourself. Mm. Because I think the Buddha also talks about you cannot have compassion for another. Be unless, Diddy. Be Diddy. Be Diddy. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. He's my own boy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you 
you've met your match here. I really, I really have. It's my sister from another mister. Wait, wait. So you said you cannot have compassion for another. Unless you have compassion for yourself. Thousand percent true. And I think I learned that the hard way in my life and also in my training. And I go into some of it in the book. But that was a real twist in the book because yeah. towards the end you start talking about how you started starving yourself basically in was it junior high or high school high school for after your freshman year yep and you started eating less and lose you were like well now my jeans fit better and then i noticed it and and your parents started to get concerned but they yep. never really directly they took you to the pediatrician they thought you had cancer yep. and i started looking at that going i did that in junior high the yeah. exact same thing yeah, i was like i'm chubby i need to do something you know that you know what really got me in that story was your father making you peanut butter and jelly sandwiches which is such a gift to, you know, it's an indian parent thing yeah eat <laughs> yes eat. exactly and you just keep eating keep eating <laughs> And you throwing it away yep. when he wasn't looking and starving yourself. Yeah. What, what was going on there? So I'm glad, you know, I haven't actually talked about this in any interview about the book. Hmm. And I'm glad to talk about it because I think it gets at this theme that we have in this discussion, which is so beautiful and essential, is that doctors are also painfully human. Hmm. And all the mess and beauty of a human life applies equally to us. I think I had grown up in a community where I was a chubby child and called fat and mannish by the aunties. Mm. Do you know the aunties? I know that Zubin's belly is so big. <laughs> he must be really enjoying the dal. Well, I used to do katak. Ah. And I was always asked to play Krishna because ah. I was more boyish than the slim little girls. Right. And I had a complex about it. And I think... There were some very sad things that happened to me as a kid. Mm. And I think one of the ways I sought to kind of get a sense of control back over my life and to achieve this false illusion of perfection was by hurting myself in that way. Mm. But I didn't see it as hurting myself. I saw it as containing myself and being perfect. And being perfect in a way I never could otherwise, because no matter how many straight A's I got, no matter what, how many spelling bees I won, oh God. I was still the chubby child who was asked to play Krishna, while all the other girls could be feminine. Mm. And I think I started to buy into, at some level, that myth that thin makes you feminine. Mm. And coming out of that, I don't know that you ever fully, or that I ever fully will come out of that self-perception mm. to be totally frank and i'm mm. saying that because i think we are sometimes expected there's a trope in this country of facing suffering and overcoming it That's fighting right. through it That's right. but i don't know that if you suffer in that deep way and you hurt yourself in that way that what's made you prone to that level of suffering ever fully goes away. Mm. And that's part of what it means now for me to find compassion for myself. When that crazy voice starts, I say, oh, crazy voice, you are part of me too. I mean, not the Me Too movement, <laughs> but you are part of me. You're part of hashtag Me Too. Yes. Yeah. You are part of me as well. And I see you and I hear you and I'm going to shut you down now. Yeah. And I couldn't see that distinction when I was in high school. Uh, man, I mean, and so many people need to hear this story because you're successful. You know, you're the medical director at a major academic center. You're living your story and sharing it with others in a book that really I found to be transformative and wonderful and beautiful. And you can suck at Atul Gawande because <laughs> this is kicking your ass. Okay, I'm looking at you, Atul. Call me. Call me. I miss you. Uh <laughs> It, but 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 telling that story actually it resonated with me too because I went yeah. through a very similar thing as a guy which yeah. is strange but I was a real chubby kid like my, this was a whole story I always tell is my mom walking into Mervyn's and being like where is the husky section oh you know and then God. and wearing those tough skin jeans because you I couldn't yeah. wear good designer jeans because they never fit because I was too short and fat. So, and my mom was like, I'm not going to take it to the tailor. That's crazy. These <laughs> tough skins work great. It's saggy. I was sagging before it was cool, bitch. Really? I was in that game. Oh I wasn't allowed to sag. Well, I didn't have no choice because <laughs> I was fat. And so... <laughs> So I had the same thing. So in junior high, I starved myself. My parents would give me $4 to buy Hot Pockets and stuff for lunch every day in junior high. And I would take the money and just hoard it away. I didn't even need the money. I was just putting it away. And so one day my mom discovered, she saw me losing weight. And you know, Indian moms, oh crap. Oh, yes. What are you, 
sorry, you have cancer. Yeah, Same you thing. Must, you must be on meth. Exactly. Or cancer. <laughs> exactly. So, so the, 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 my mother was like, she saw it right away. She's a psychiatrist. She's like, yeah. dude, you have an eating disorder. What are you doing? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm fat. I need to get in. Everyone else is doing yeah. multiple pull-ups. I can do 10 pull-ups now. I couldn't do one. Everyone else is getting presidential and PE. I'm getting nothing. Yep. I'm getting made fun of. Like, this is the best I've ever looked. This is great. And you know, all sunken and looking like shit probably had electrolyte abnormalities probably stunned in my growth i totally think about that right like my potassium i mean you could have either of us could have just arrested arrested in the middle of the night exactly and then we then we would have been one of the stories in your book yes. right it's true <laughs> it's totally we would have been the people true. with the parents by the bedside the yep. whole time and and feeling all the shame and all this and and so we we managed to dodge that bullet but i remember my, my mother just being so like, listen, what the hell? But my dad coming in the room and being like, okay, buddy, I heard what you're doing, okay? Mm. If you need money, you just need to tell me. <laughs> like, he thought it was all about the money. Like, I was saving the lunch money. And I'm like, oh. you know what? I kind of like that better. It's easier to deal with. But yeah, but we, you got to grow it, but it's yeah. part of who you are. Exactly. And, and it, it does. Those voices do come back. Every now and yes. again, I'll just be like, I'll show my kids, like, you see this? Daddy didn't always look like this. It's like <laughs> the story you tell in the book. Daddy didn't always look like this, all right? <laughs> I used to have a full 360 muffin top. <laughs> oh, man. But it was really wonderful that you shared that piece and, and that you didn't have to dive in further. It was just enough. Just enough. And I think, you know, in some of the other doctor memoirs I've read, I have longed as someone who loves literature for the mess and the yeah, beauty. Yeah. And I really wanted to be as human as I could with my readers. And that's why I just put a touch in there. Yeah, yeah. Just and I a, didn't need to go on. I just, the amount I said was all I wanted to say. And, and it was perfect. I actually noticed that exactly as a meta phenomenon. I'm like, she just put in enough. Because people can get in the weeds in that, yeah. but that's not what this book is about. This yeah. book is about a human being's journey through this path yeah. with other human beings and the karma that results. I'm saying karma. Yeah, I'm an atheist. I'm saying karma and stuff. And stuff. <laughs> <laughs> B Diddy, what'd you call my own boy? <laughs> Buddha is my own hey, boy. Man, B Diddy's my own boy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Pour a little I out. Can't even. Pour a little out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, Mara, I see you, Mara. You try to step to me. Mara's the bad guy. Oh. I, apparently, I don't know. I don't really. I'm not really a Buddhist. I'm more like like the vibe of it. Anyways, I think we've gone an hour and 15 minutes or something, oh. uh, just to respect our audience's sanity. By the way, the comments are. It's amazing how many healthcare experiences, uh, how many in healthcare experience trauma in childhood. Sam Newkirk, right? Um, I the wounded healer. The wounded healer. This nurses true. in particular. Yep. Because there's nurturer types, right? Yep. Not all doctors are nurturer types like you. A lot of them are like, you know, well, I'm just a fucking, you know. It's a, and maybe that's a different manifestation of oh, whatever could, trauma. Right. It could be had. expectations. And I think no human being makes it through this life unscathed how much you dive into the ways that you have been hurt and the ways that you have suffered, that's what's up to you. But the mm. fact of the suffering is inescapable. Inescapable. And that's and the thing is, that means you don't deny suffering. One of the things you say in the book was, we're here to bear witness, more or less, yeah. I'm paraphrasing, to suffering. To your grandmother, that's what it was. Yep. Yeah, she was having, this, the, having the COPD and the, the emphysema. <laughs> And she was suffering, but what she needed was you you were there to you have to bear witness because yeah. people suffer in silence and that's yep. the hardest. That's the hardest. And I think we can go out with this comment, which is uh, where was it? Damn it. Was late to the party. What's the name of the book? It's called That Good Night. Shazam. It's on Amazon. We put a link in here. This whole thing will come out soon. Uh, it's just for supporters right now, but definitely go but get this book. Get this book and read it on Kindle or whatever you like. And there was another comment about our chemistry. Ah, Amy Hakim says, your chemistry, have her on regularly. She is amazing too. Dude. Cardi P. Cardi P. Hashtag Cardi P. Skrrt. <laughs> Skrrt. Dude, I'm in. I'm in. Hey, I will come back here anytime. I love it. Uh, we would have you, you anytime. You should come to USC. Oh, hell yeah. I will totally do that. Let's let's go through the Dr. LBC. Dr. Dre is involved. In oh, if Dr. Dre, USC. the Drizze? The Drizze. Oh, yeah, Dr. DRE, digital rectal exam. Yes. We still want to do that. Still DRE. Tom <laughs> wants to make that happen. Uh, all right, guys. Listen, <laughs> if you love what we're doing on the show, Dr. Sunita Puri is just by far one of my favorite guests of all time because we have too much in common. People are probably like, I don't get it. But I'm like, this is this is it. 
Uh, become become a subscriber. If you don't want to do that, hit like and hit share. Share this video. It's so important. And whether you buy the book or not, spread the word about what palliative care does because it is central to building health 3.0. All right. I don't know, girl. Any parting words of wisdom? Your booty got me lost like Nemo. <laughs> To quote, walk a flock of flame. Walk a flock of flame, by the way. I feel like he sums up this whole conversation. He kind of takes it to that next level. He does. I I think it's just, no, in all seriousness, although I do think walk a flock is very serious, but thank you for having me on. Really, like, everything you do brings my team so much joy. We watch your videos all the time. Every med student that comes on my rotation, they they usually all know about you, but if they don't... It's a learning objective of the palliative care rotation. So you bring a lot of joy, and to be a part of this was just amazing. So thank you. It, it's continuing musical education, bitch. West Side! <laughs> Two of the best from the West Side. That's right! Now follow as we ride! All right, we out. Let's do a thumbnail. Look at that camera right there and do something thumbnailish. Do you see that one up there with the red light? Oh, yeah. oh there. Yo, what up? <laughs> West side. <laughs> <laughs>